Hey, what's up, everybody? This is a guest, Lee Stamos, from the camera that will not now autofocus. Are you kidding me? Is that the technical name of the new podcast? <laughs> okay. This is the camera that will not autofocus. It does a lot for my complexion, though, so that's good. All right. I guess it needed a few minutes to think. So welcome back to another quarterly financial special here on the E2KG uh, network, our fine family and a uh, small circle of gaming podcasts. So with me tonight, I have Mr. D.B. Qham. So how you doing, D.B.? I'm good. I'm good. My camera seems to focus, so we'll see if it holds up. Yeah. So uh, tonight we will be recanting all of our speculations and analysis of the recently released, recently released uh, uh, calendar year second quarter uh, financial, I'm sorry, calendar year first quarter uh, quarterly results. Um, hold on, hold on a minute, there, Glassy Clues. So you just said we're going to be recanting our our reports, which which would mean that we are taking them back, right? Like our projections were wrong, so we are going to recant that. I believe we are going to be recapping, yes. but there probably is some recanting there in in the process of it as well. We'll, we'll probably recant some things. We will probably uh, uh, beg forgiveness and uh, and retract and redact uh, many things that we say in uh, tonight's episode. So uh, we've done this once before, uh, DBQ and I, uh, last year. Was that, did we do end of year financials last year? Is that what yeah, we, we did end of fiscal year last year. Okay. So. so that was a very full packed show. There was a lot that, uh, it was holiday season. Um, so some of those reports uh, it impacted that. We have holiday sales numbers and things like that. So uh, tonight I feel it's a little, it's, it's a little lighter in some ways. I feel like the manufacturers don't have a lot to say because one, they're prepping for build up to E3 and two, but honestly, I feel like I don't want to say that this generation is is boring, but I feel like this generation is is kind of packed up, right? Um, we we know where we are. The table has been set for some time. The numbers aren't going to change that much, and and everybody, as far as their quarterly earnings reports are going, are are kind of just dialing it in. I think. Um, yeah, I think that's right. On the publisher end, I mean, there's there's not a lot of new, uh, there's no new hardware that was released. Well, I guess we get a little bit of Xbox though. Um, but you're right. I think it is kind of dialed in. We kind of know everybody's playing within their their own little their own little framework here. And I think the the bigger change is not really a change, right? Is the continued progression of where third parties are seeing their revenue, and so we'll we'll talk about that as well. Yeah, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to be a little challenged. I'm going to be trying to talk through uh, at least this first part here while I'm getting the social media out. Uh, so um, let's start at the top of the hour, so to speak, with Microsoft. Uh, so, um, and this is one of the things that, uh, so I guess I want to talk a little bit of process, DB, as we're uh, getting started here to, to set some table stakes. So normally when we do this, uh, what I have done in the past is I not wanting to be sullied, dirtied, influenced by uh, by reports from other analysts, I typically start my research off with this actually reviewing the earnings reports myself, then viewing the uh, the earnings call slides, writing my own notes, making my own analyses, and then I clean up by checking two or three other analyst reports just to make sure I didn't miss anything. Um, and in some cases, sometimes the like with Activision's like things can get very buried. Um, so I look for that help. This time, um, I, I originally said I wasn't going to do that because I was a little more pressed for time. I decided to do that. But quite honestly, I didn't feel like there was a, a ton of stuff. And actually, rather than have the actual earnings reports open and the slide deck open, which is what I did last time, I feel like I was able to put all my notes in the rundown and we'll just basically be able to read from there. So um, that's just a little inside baseball to kind of give people some frame of kind of the level of detail uh, and, and the level of dynamics that are going on, in my opinion, in the gaming industry now, at least for the manufacturers in this latter part of this generation. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I just want to tie into that, too. I think that, that that mirrors a lot of my process. Uh, but, you know, because of the, the third party publishers here, they've been releasing their their they're not only fourth quarterly earnings, but annual reports kind of dripping them out over the, the first three weeks of May here. And so I've had the chance to 
to read news releases as they came out. But in prep for the show over the last week or so, I've gone back to to each of the annual reports, each of the, the fiscal reports. I've looked at the slides, looked at their press releases, but kind of dove into the numbers as well. And sometimes that makes it more confusing as my calculations don't always match up, um, you know, in terms of, uh, of things. But it's also a, a place where I get to use my, my undergraduate degree in econ and put to work some of those accounting classes that I took in terms of trying to figure out uh, gap revenue and, and and net earnings and everything else. So let's dive in. And, and what do we have at the top of the hour here with Microsoft, I guess, please? Yeah, so uh, revenue is up 18%. I sometimes hate to report that number because without a frame of reference, it really doesn't mean anything, but I feel like sometimes you have to. Uh, so 2.251 billion, I believe is what it was uh, for the pre previous quarter. And uh, and we're talking the, the January through March quarter. So those earnings reports uh, uh, started to filter in kind of near the end of April, early May, and are just wrapping up. Um, so for some, I think for Microsoft, it was their Q, it was their fiscal year 18 uh, Q3. Uh, I think in the case of Nintendo, it was actually their uh, their end of financial year, I think. Um, but at any rate, uh, again, Microsoft at two, about 2.25 billion in revenue uh, compared to 1.906 billion dollars uh, last year. Uh, Microsoft's own statement is that the, the the increase, the bump, the additional um, 300 million or so, was driven largely by software and services. And I thought it was very interesting that the services, um, because they also talk very large about Xbox Live subscriber numbers. But this service uh, dynamic was really driven by um, MMO-like games. That was my own analysis. And then as I read further into the report, they attributed it really to Fortnite, um, as well as Game Pass. One of the reasons I thought that was very interesting is because they also have PUBG, which they have launched as, a, as an Xbox Live exclusive, um, potentially a timed exclusive, has a ton of cross-play with other platforms. Um, but... Uh, but the attribution for a big part of their revenue bump, specifically 24% uh, of that um, of services revenue, now, we don't know what the split it was between software and services revenue. They attributed the overall increase to both software and services. But of the services part, they're saying 24% of the services increase came from third-party titles, primarily games like Fortnite. Are, are so, but Fortnite, Fortnite and games. I'm sorry, is a Fortnite's a free-to-play game. So, does that mean that they're making enough revenue off of the cut of in-game purchases right. from Fortnite? Right. Yep. So, wow. I mean, that's again just a sheer sign of of how large Fortnite is as a as an economic juggernaut there. Right. And and microtransactions. I mean, microtransactions is kind of a foregone at this point. Um, but the notion that a, a, a game like Fortnite could have that much, a third party title could have that much of an influence on a manufacturer's revenue is, is pretty significant. Um, so, and, and also Game Pass, uh, you know, I don't want to undersell that uh, too much as well. Well, and this would be the quarter when Game Pass was sold pretty heavily as a Sea of Thieves uh, exclusive, right? Like you could play Sea of Thieves uh, for better or for worse, but Game Pass was was highly touted here. So the reports, you know, you're you're reporting back on their Q4 earnings at the end of their fiscal year. And so some of these, uh, as you said, will wrap up just their quarter and some of them will be uh, end of the fiscal year pieces. So what else did, did Microsoft tell us? Yeah, so uh, 59 million active Xbox Live users up 13% from about 52 million uh, year over year. Uh, I, I didn't really particularly care for this uh, being in their report be, just because... Um, what they include in that is all their cross-platform uh, accesses of, uh, of of Xbox Live. So that includes uh, from mobile phone, uh, from from PCs, uh, and from tablets. Um, so that it just bugs me because I don't feel like it gives me a it doesn't give me a genuine picture, right? If you're going to talk subscription numbers for your uh, online gaming infrastructure service, the only thing I care about, the only thing that to me is really impactful in, in terms of the industry, is who's using that to access multiplayer. Um, and now again, you have weird things like, so I, I kind of wish uh, uh, Prime was on because he is playing PUBG mobile. Um, and I don't really understand how, if, if, you, if, you, if you're on the game and you log in, are you logging in using your Xbox Live ID? 
Um, no, the mobile game is is a ten cent uh, is a production there. It has nothing to do with um, Xbox. Uh, so yeah, so I don't. Uh, so that probably doesn't contribute to uh, to those numbers. But um, so at any rate, it is what it is. Uh, overall, Xbox Live usage is up again. It will be in. I don't. I don't even know that Sony mentioned uh, how many. Um, I don't think they mentioned how many subscribers they had because the last time they reported it, it, it to, to me, it was an embarrassing number. It was like less than 50% of their total units sold. Uh, it was actually very close to a third of their total units sold. And I was kind of like, I don't know that that's a number that I would be reporting in my earnings call. Um, but, uh, but at any rate, Xbox is proud uh, of that number. We'll come back to that and, and the reason why. Uh, sea of Thieves was released and it was the fastest rare, fastest selling rare game since 1995. Uh, sold uh, 1 million units in its first two days. Uh, impressive. Of course, the uptake thereafter and the word on the street about that game is probably uh, uh, less favorable than those uh, than those sales numbers would indicate. They had 5% growth in operating expenses, largely contributable, contributable to games. Now, Microsoft, of course, the other thing that makes Microsoft tough is, of course, all this information is buried in their larger corporate. It's a corporate earnings call, and you kind of have to pick the games division stuff out of it. Um, they do... Over the years, they've been raising that more and more so to the surface and, and reporting it as a discrete from the rest of the corporate division earnings. But um, but uh, but this point uh, that they made was that uh, they are investing um, in things. I'm sure they are investing in games as a service um, and uh, and increased the amount that they're spending um, investing in those games. They refer to it specifically as an investment in those services by 5%. My belief, again, is that they are busily like busy little bees working at uh, infrastructure updates to uh, to Azure um, and its connection and support of the Xbox Live as its backbone in preps to roll out games as a service um, on, a, on a larger scale in the upcoming generation or or maybe directly supporting PC. Um, so there's that. And, uh, and, and I thought it was interesting, but also very predictable. Um, I kind of thought the, the, the analyst who asked this question was kind of a jerk. Um, because he knows what the answer is. Uh, so, it, so an analyst asked uh, Satya Nadala uh, during the Q and A session um, about exclusives on Xbox One, um, and, I, and I believe the analyst stated that you know that Sony. In fact, I'm pretty sure the analyst stated that you know that Sony uh, has a number of exclusives for PlayStation, um, and he asked uh, Nadala about how um, how he felt Xbox measured up because exclusives were a primary incentive to people to buy a console. Um, Nadal, of course, responded, and, and one didn't speak about Sony. I mean, he's he's not Sony CEO, so he really couldn't speak to what Sony's doing. Um, but he, you know, he mentioned exactly what I would have expected of him, which is that for, for Xbox, um, you know, the games division, games revenue, the, the gaming business is about more than the console. So that is clear and obvious to anybody who spent 30 seconds doing any research over the last year. Um, and, and I think Microsoft has addressed this before. They, 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 they want to do more exclusives on there, but, but at the end of the day, their primary strategy is not so tightly coupled to, you know, you know, what what number X indicates the number of exclusives that are there for Xbox One. Um, so, great. That, that's yeah, that's what I have for Microsoft. That sounds good. When you got another console here that does have a lot of exclusives, and that is kind of driving their business, right? With Nintendo. Ish. Uh, Ish. Okay. Well, that's a good sign for Nintendo. That it's a little more diverse than it has been. So, what are the reports right. there? So yeah. So Nintendo. Uh, what, the first thing that caught my eye in their earnings report is they specifically broke out what titles they have that have sold over a million units. I thought that was a very good thing to point out. Now, Nintendo takes my articulation of Sony's strategy on exclusives and explodes out even more. My assessment of Sony is people always talk about how many exclusives Sony has, and I say, yes, they do, but they're highly diversified, and they only sell those exclusives to a, a smaller percentage of their total user base than when Microsoft releases an exclusive. When Microsoft receives, releases an exclusive, a large portion of the of the Xbox uh, user base goes and buys that version of Halo or Gears of War or Forza, whereas Sony puts out more exclusives, but like only so many people wanted to play God of War or Horizon Zero Dawn, um, and it's not like the vast majority of their user base because their user base is more diverse. The, Nintendo is kind of like the next level of that. So, uh, 
so when, when I think about Xbox Live exclusives, I think about, um, or Xbox exclusives, I think about sales numbers in the, in the uh, eight, nine, tens of million units and higher. Uh, when I think about Sony, I think about things in the, in the three million units during the PlayStation 3 era. They have gotten bigger, and I would, I would think of them in that like the three to eight million band. Um, Nintendo, when they release their exclusives, uh, it, it varies, and sometimes it's as low as one million units which is what they called out here. So uh, game titles selling 1 million units uh, on the Switch, um, Super Mario Odyssey, uh, Mario Kart 8, uh, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, uh, Splatoon 2, uh, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, ARMS 1, 2, Switch. 1, 2, Switch? Really? Uh, Xenoblade Chronicles 2, Kirby Star Allies, and Pokemon Tournament DX. Any of those uh, titles uh, surprise you, DB? Uh, I think the Pokemon Tournament one actually surprises me, and maybe the Kirby Kirby shows a, a strong start, right? Because that only released at the toward the end of March, which would have been toward the end of Nintendo's fiscal. So there's a, a smaller window there. I mean, I think we've we reported here on on E2KG about uh, you know the 10 million that Odyssey sold and Mario Kart 8 sell, selling 6.6 or so million over the course of the Switches. Uh, fiscal year, so quite a bit. Uh, but yeah, I think the Pokemon tournament, the fact that uh, the GameCube re-release, uh, I think One Two Switch doesn't really surprise me because it was one of the launch games and it was uh, one of the few things that were available. Um, but yeah, I, I, any there that surprised you? I guess the Kirby, like you mentioned, given its uh, fairly recent release, uh, in comparison to something like Breath of the Wild, which has been on the street for a year, right? Um, so Good on Kirby, I guess. Uh, 15.05 million units sold. That number, I, I mean, literally, I, I've seen wavering all over the place uh, with analysts. Uh, I believe this is the number, the official number from the Nintendo earnings report was 15.05 million units sold. Uh, pretty remarkable uh, in one year of sales of a brand new launching console that is different from anything else that I would say most of the gaming industry and journalists didn't get. Um, you know, it, it, including partially my, myself, um, I certainly didn't get it up until the January uh, pre-release announcement. Um, then once I saw and realized what it was, I, I, I went full bore with it. Um, but uh, 15 million units sold. Uh, so is that is that 15 within this fiscal year, or is that year to, or lifetime? I believe that is lifetime. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think I've seen I've seen up as high as 18 or 19 lifetime. Um, which would also attribute for the 3 million or so that were sold in the first March of last fiscal year too. Right. So okay. either way, still really impressive for a, a console that's doing something different. Yeah. Even more impressive, 6.4 million Nintendo 3DSs sold. Uh, so this is clearly year over year. Uh, 72 million sold worldwide to date. That puts the Nintendo 3DS in the running with some of the... Uh, highest selling consoles ever. Um, I think uh, PlayStation 2 is like 150 million. I think PlayStation 3 is like 80 million. Um, of course, PlayStation 4 is knocking right on PlayStation 3's door, uh, I think, with uh, lifetime sales. Um, so DS is up there quite a bit. It's yeah. in the over 100 million as well. Yeah. Another impressive number, 87% increase in digital sales on the Switch. Now, this number, as I've mentioned before, is more impressive to me because I feel like the primary way of buying things on the Switch for most people, I would think, would be physical because there's a there's a constrained amount of storage on the Switch. Um, even when you buy, even when I buy a 128 gig card, um, I, I still, when I have the opportunity, prefer to buy digital because I just don't want that space getting sucked up left and right. Um, so. So impressive, but it is incredibly easy to buy things uh, on that console and to buy them on the go when you have it packed on travel. Um, so, so that's impressive. Uh, what I really like about this next bullet is I feel like it corroborates my opinion of this whole uh, uh, classic addiction. Classic addiction. <laughs> Very appropriate. It's a classic addiction um, as far as the number of eyeballs that get put on headlines on this when people post stuff about it on the internet. However, as I have felt, the business model is actually much smaller 
um, than, than you would think. Um, and it shows that to me, it's, it's not a big moneymaker uh, for, um, for Nintendo. Uh, it's probably got a very high profit margin, um, but it's not bringing in a lot of dollars in total compared to the Switch and associated games. And that's Super NES Classic Addiction. Classic. Classic Edition sold 5.28 million units. Note, not even as many as the Nintendo 3DS, which is an aging console, uh, in my opinion, with a with a dwindling library as far as new releases that come out. Um, so I wonder, though, how much of that is supply chain uh, constraints as well, right? I mean, now it is it is a little easier to find on the shelves, although just this week there's been headlines about Walmart getting them back in stock finally. Um, right. So, you know, I, but I think you're right. I think it, the fact that the 3DS... Uh, is higher than that number also shows kind of where those markets are. Right. Uh, 62% increase in income for mobile unit sales and, uh, and our, our co-host uh, Swiss guard reported on some of these numbers. Um, I think in our quarterly show that preceded this one, uh, not our financial show, just our quarterly kind of state of the industry uh, discussion where he mentioned that uh, the big mover um, in this was uh, you're going to have to help me out was um was uh, are we talking about fire, a game? Was, was the Fire Emblem game, which, uh, if I remember correctly, is free to play. Um, but you 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 buy in-app purchases and buy add-ons as much. No, no, not for Sony. Couldn't have been Fire Emblem. No, 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 no. for Nintendo. For Nintendo. Yeah. Free to play. Oh yes, yeah. The the for their mobile aspect. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So, their mobile sales were yeah mainly was uh, Fire Emblem dominated there. Yes. Right. Um, but uh, piling on into that was also the release of um, of uh, Animal Crossing Animal on Crossing, mobile. Yes. Yes. Yep. For some reason, I was wanted to call it Nintendo Dogs. Um, so uh, again, I'm not as familiar with Nintendo as a platform, although I am a Switch owner. I am fairly new to the ecosystem. Um, net sales total up a 175.5 percent, uh, which is uh, which was represented over a 31.3 percent increase in profit. When your company increases total profit by a whole third in a year that's a big deal i don't <laughs> yeah it is it's also a sign of how terrible the wii was doing and <laughs> kind of the state that nintendo was in as well so, so but it's a bar, great sign yeah maybe the bar was set very low um what, what i what i will kept on saying is i have for i think forever um have been a person who has highly questioned nintendo's business model um, not understood what it was that they were doing and failing to capitalize on many opportunities. Uh, I haven't had Jack to say in that vein for about a year. <laughs> so, and I think a lot of other uh, journalists and analysts have not either. Um, Sony, 79 million PlayStation 4 sold. Lifetime PS3 sales, as I mentioned, were 83.8. So they're knocking on the door of that particular ring. PlayStation 2s were 155 million. Xbox One, we believe, is are 36 million. Of course, going back to Microsoft, didn't announce or state anything about numbers of total units sold. It's kind of a, a very uh, Apple-esque kind of approach. Uh, but, but, but Microsoft has also mastered that craft uh, with regards to uh, other elements of their earnings. Call have historically not reported actual numbers. And of course, Amazon does that for things like the Kindle. So, um, but we're 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 guessing uh, at this point. Uh, the games division uh, revenue, which is their games and network division, uh, if everyone remembers, a few years ago, um, after the big uh, uh, network hack, PlayStation Network hack of 2012, I think, um, or 2011, uh, the net the gaming services network division was collapsed into the games division, and and Kaz headed up that whole um, big thing uh, while he was head uh, uh PlayStation. Um, and in a sense, stayed together. And so their earnings reports are reported uh, concurrently or in conjunction as one aggregate. Uh, games division uh, revenue was up 17.8% uh, driven, they say, mainly by PlayStation Plus subscribers and digital game sales. Now, a little suspect, I think, just in that uh, I still don't get it, but you know, they, they say driven by PlayStation Plus subscribers, but they didn't report the number this time. Whereas they did report the number last time, and I, like I said, it was highly um, uh, not, uh, you know, confidence inspiring. I would say, to say the least. Um, maybe more people have been subscribing to PlayStation Plus. Um, again, I would question doing things like going out and buying a PlayStation Four and not subscribing to PlayStation Plus. Um, but 
but we have we have members on the cast who who have had PlayStation Plus uh, accounts but have let them lapse um, because they weren't providing any value to them. And I would definitely consider us, you know, core gamers. So so that's an, it's an interesting dynamic what's going on there. Why Sony um, has not been able to encourage greater uptake of the PlayStation Plus um, uh, service. Uh, digital game sales up, of course. Uh, Games and Network Services Division is the largest and highest margin amongst all of the uh, Sony divisions, um, and that has been the state since the uh, 3D TV craze and 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 following crash, uh, which occurred that year, uh, which I think was maybe a couple years before uh, the Games and Network Services Division were combined. Um, their guidance in the future, I thought, was the most interesting thing. Uh, they're expecting a decrease in PlayStation 4 sales over the next year but an increase in software sales, including digital. Um, so what that paints to me is that they think that the, the PlayStation 4, PlayStation 4 Pro have kind of hit their apex in terms of, uh, of total uptake. You're now going to get people who are just kind of recapping units that have gotten old, maybe damaged, may, may need repair. Um, people who are buying a, a second PlayStation 4 or a third PlayStation 4 um, who are, who just want a new SKU uh, when it's released or a special edition model. Uh, but but it's just not they're expecting it's not going to be selling uh, like hotcakes as if it were a new console. Um, however, we're entering the phase of the generation where very incredible games will come out in comparison to what was released earlier in this generation, as developers have gotten a handle much more so on the development kit. Um, and so I expect that that will drive higher game sales. Um, and again, you know, more and more uh, consumers are converting over to. Um, uh, buying their things digitally so yeah i think that uh the digital conversion there is a great segue into third parties because that really begins the the kind of uh constant uh rallying cry here for for third parties in terms of, of digital sales and we'll see that so we've got a number of different third parties to look at here we're going to run through um a variety of them so please feel free to jump in at any point in time so ea um oh, ea we you know right with all the loot box uh, controversy and all the other uh press that ea got they still ended up uh with a little bit of of a net revenue increase over the fiscal year so their their net revenue is up about six percent uh their net revenue for the fourth quarter which would be kind of the you know the beginning and the holiday sales and into uh, the no uh, it would be january right so that was up about four percent uh, so six percent overall game downloads uh were up about ten percent which also meant that digital revenue in terms of both downloads and microtransactions was up 18 percent uh year over year so uh, that that piece is is a sound piece there and unlike uh, nintendo where their mobile revenue was up quite a bit mobile on ea was only up four percent and so in terms of a percentage there one of the pieces that i found interesting was that their packaged goods were still up about 19 percent year over year so even in spite of of all the controversy uh, around you know battlefront to that the package goods were still selling well for for ea and so again they're, they're just like last year at this time we were talking about the amount of of revenue coming in for for digital transactions versus package goods that digital sales are still there they have make up a, a strong uh not quite a majority, but again, a significant revenue portion there. And, and that will also be the case here for Activision as we look at uh, Activision and where they're at in terms of, of their revenue as well. So I'm gonna move into that, but so, so I guess to please, yeah, go ahead. So I'm jumping ahead a little as I, as I scroll down as you kick this off to, to look for a trend. Very interesting that the publishers are all hovering around uh, this you know, one to one percent to six percent increase in revenue, while the manufacturers are all feasting on revenue increases of eighteen percent, you know, seventeen point eight percent. Nintendo, I didn't see where they reported overall revenue increase, but again, their profit is up thirty one. Like, the manufacturers are just going to town, and the publishers all seem to be kind of struggling. Like, how is that possible? 
Yeah, so that's a really good question because, right, we've got Activision at about uh, 6% revenue, which is similar to EA. Take two, uh, their revenue grew. Um, actually, they were, their revenue only grew just a, just a little over less than 1%. Um, Ubisoft did see a huge bump in their sales, so their sales uh, are, are doing well. But you're right, um, you know, consistently, Square Enix, you know, that we're, we're in single digits here in terms of any type of growth on the 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 majority of the third party publishers. So yeah, I don't I don't quite know where that is. I think part of it is and this comes into play a lot with with both Activision and EA. It's the the cyclical nature of their catalog, right? So for a single party publisher, they've got the hardware and they've got a cut as we talked about with Microsoft of of everything else that's been sold, right? And Fortnite can can be a significant contribution to their revenue, but it's not even their game, and all they're getting is a side cut of microtransactions. So for things like for EA, right, their big uh, fall releases outside of sports games, which which did fine, but most of the sports games there make their money on microtransactions. You had Battlefront, which has already been reported to having lower than anticipated or projected sales, and Need for Speed, which was not uh, didn't nearly make any of their sales targets. So, so I think that that is is part of of their ebb and flow on the EA front. Activision, you know, they are they had a really strong uh, 16, 17 because of the release and success of Overwatch, and that really bolstered they'll say their 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 sales and this is one of the the interesting things right activision i always find really interesting because of the kind of three-legged stool that it is between traditional activision with call of duty and what used to be skylanders and destiny and then blizzard uh with overwatch and world of warcraft and king with candy crush candy crush saga and so in the past that that uh last year i remember looking back at that data and Activision's percentage of their revenue out of those three was significantly lower than King and and uh, Blizzard. But this year, it flips around a little bit, where this year they've had uh, strong performances where by Activision and King. They're up, mainly bolstered by a strong Call of Duty and a strong initial sales of Destiny 2 and the continued strength and, and growth of mobile, where Blizzard hasn't really had uh, any big release, any big tentpole release um, for them. And so, so for Activision, they're able to kind of keep that that cycle going and flip flop between multiple kind of in house publishers there to some degree. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, only other thing I mentioned before you move on to Activision is I, I guess um, maybe this is also indicative of where we are generationally with the console generation. So, of course, consoles launch typically. Nintendo being the crazy exception with um, console manufacturers taking a loss as the investment in R&D and the cost per unit uh, to build out a console is actually more than they're selling it for. Um, but, then that, but then that slowly flips around and they start making money on the consoles as that R&D um, has, been, uh, has been capitalized and, uh, and depreciated and, uh, and the manufacturing costs decrease as efficiencies are realized. Um, so so th this may be a part of a thing where that thing is just going to be on an upward curve until they switch hardware. Um, and, and you're going to have definitely Sony. I mean, PlayStation 4 is really, um, you know, new uh, next generation parts in the same chassis uh, in, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, Xbox One X Scorp Scorpio, uh, Xbox One X has, I think, a little more new architecting in it than maybe the PlayStation 4 Pro does. Um, so, so their margin on hardware may not be as big. I mean, of course, they're not selling as many units, but um, this may just be a, a state that we a trend that we may expect to see for the remainder of this console generation. I think that's really astute, right? I mean, that is kind of the the economics of of console manufacturing is that they do make up that over the life cycle. Where in a publisher, they've got continual R and D investment in terms of development of games and resources and and sustaining those resources through microtransaction and additional content. So I think that is a, a really good point. And that actually one of I pulled this quote of all the the 
I don't know, eight different financial reports I looked through, this was the one quote that really kind of stuck out to me from Activisions, which says, the markets we serve grew faster than we did last year, but we are determined to change that over the next few years, right? It goes right back to your point, I guess, at least in terms of, you know, the market in general, in terms of the hardware market and the video games market, definitely outpaced the majority of, of third-party publishers. So at Activision, it, it, they go on to spend a lot of time not talking about their games, but talking about their their other investments, right? And so we see this with with Overwatch, and they talk about the uh, Overwatch League, and it's expanding, and they're looking to expand additional teams, and they even mentioned starting a Call of Duty competitive league. Uh, they cite uh, selling the broadcast rights of Overwatch League for $100 million and about a quarter of a billion, so 225 million, uh, for the sale of the 12 different Overwatch teams. So all of that there, uh, in addition to their game content, that results in the revenue being up about 6%. Which really, if you... So here's the, the part that makes that 6% in the, the positive, is that their digital revenue is up 17%. Right? So if we... If we parse that out in the averages of their their boxed revenue and their other expenditures and their digital revenue, and if their digital revenue is up 17%, but their overall revenue is only up 6 they've taken some losses this year. They've taken some hits. Um, and so I think that you know they do mention that here where consolidated net income was down 72%. Uh, but they quickly, as all good corporations do, point out that a lot of that is due to accounting and tax changes. So, right, no worries, investors. Uh, you know, your your earnings per share increased 4% or 4 cents, not 4%, but just 4 cents year over year. Uh, but again, I think one of the big performers there in the digital revenue is is the continued strong performance of King uh, with their, their mobile games. Uh, they also talk about... Uh, it's, this is interesting, and this, I think, goes right into last week's announcement of Black Ops 4, is where they talk about they had a strong performance with, with Call of Duty World War II, uh, again, performing better than the year before, but they talked about uh, the continued strength and success of microtransactions in Black Ops 3. So again, a two-year-old game uh, earning in more or at least getting uh, equal calling time with with a more recent game and so i think that that highlights what they're they're going towards with with black ops 4 in terms of even at the press conference last week where they announced that it, it's built for years to come because they're seeing revenue there so uh, i think that they that piece is is a real key uh, and again, that aspect of of their their three tent poles there with Blizzard, Activision, and King, and how they're swapping this year compared to last year. So I'm going to move into take two, which last year talked about their big statement last year uh, was about how they wanted recurrent spending opportunities built into all their games, right? We want microtransactions built into all their games. This is take two, who took a lot of heat during uh, NBA 2K18's release in terms of the heavy microtransaction uh, incorporation. Uh, but it's also Take-Two that has seen <laughs> GTA 5 online continue to rank in um, you know, sales after sales and, and hit over 90 million sold in a lifetime. So, uh, right, which is another interesting feat where if you've got a single game that sold uh, almost as much or more than than a platform. Uh, so we've got in take two, their recurrent spending, right? And again, this is the big theme of, of microtransactions and consistent player engagement. It grew 42%. And last year, that was already 43% uh, of what their total revenue was. And so to have it grow an additional 42%, um, which is, again, a real key piece here because their overall net revenue uh, dropped 21%, uh, which, again, it gives them that that inch there of where they've only made just under a 1% increase in overall revenue. So while their physical revenue has dropped, their, their 
uh, even their sales, but their recurrent spending has, has dramatically increased. And that's accounted for 44% of their total revenue, uh, which, is, which is higher than last year as well. Uh, digital delivered revenue grew 8%. So again, we're seeing a lot of those trends uh, coming up over and over again here. Uh, year over year spending for recurrent spending grew 63%. Um, uh, which is a, a huge piece, and digital delivered revenue grew 23%. So, so again, uh, for take two, those microtransactions are not going anywhere. Um, we'll see that. It'll be interesting to see what take two announces at E3 and where they're building in that uh, wonderful corporate uh, recurrent. Uh, engagement opportunities, i.e. spending opportunities. So let's move on to Ubisoft, which actually saw a huge bump in their sales. Their sales were up 18.6% year over year. Uh, this was a big factor in their, uh, this is their yearly, so they saw a big increase with uh, Assassin's Creed Origins and their uh, Far Cry 5 outperformed uh, their expectations. Their quarter four earnings uh, year over year were down a little bit, but they also had two big releases last year during quarter four with For Honor and uh, Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon Wildlands. They, um, it, it mentions when they, when they start talking about their 2019 uh, predictions, or not predictions, but forecasts, right? Uh, that they say that the, the crew two and uh, they, you know, they list two sequels, The Crew 2 and The Division 2, along with one other uh, unannounced franchise title, right? And so that that franchise title is one that we've speculated here on, on E2KG. Um, but I think the fact that they name The Division 2 as coming within this, this current fiscal year for them means that we're probably looking at a 2019 uh, March release again, trying to squeeze that in in that Far Cry Wildlands window. So a lot, there's plenty of, of comments in Ubisoft's uh, financial reports related to to kind of their, their volatile shares over the last year, right, with all the Vivendi takeovers that's been going on for a number of years. But they are, are proud to point out their, their specific buybacks from Vivendi in their earnings call to kind of firm up some things. One of the things that Ubisoft does that that the other third parties don't do, and they've done this for the last couple of years here, is they give you percentages of sales by platform. And so, uh, again, uh, we saw that uh, PlayStation 4 last year was about 41% of their sales. This year, it's 42%. Uh, Xbox One dropped from 27% last year down to 23% this year. So again, it, it falls within that, that percentage range that we see of not quite a two to one, but of close in terms of install base for Xbox and PlayStation 4. And switch sales obviously were, were not a big thing last year for Ubisoft, but they have uh, they accounted for all of seven uh, percent of Ubisoft's sales. So, some yeah, good so, news there for Ubisoft. So yeah, so the division, the first iteration of the division, I thought it was a fact check while you where you were reporting, uh, was also a March release uh, in 2016. So that your prediction seems to line up with what would be a potential March release in 2019 for the Division 2. I'm just glad that they pinned it down and, and, and announced it um, with some conviction. Nothing on uh, the performance of, um, you're going to have to help me with the title of, of the Rabbids title on Switch. Mario plus Rabbids Kingdom yeah. Battle. Yeah, no, I think, I, you know, I guess the, the only, the two Ubisoft games on the Switch that I can think of are, uh, no, I guess there's a couple, right? There's there's a Raymond's collection, a Raymond collection. There's the Kingdom Battle Rabbids game, and there is Just Dance. And so, so no, they did not parse those out in terms of. They did mention the the strong performance of that on the Switch, but they did not say uh, any type of sales numbers. They really just mentioned it in terms of as they were were hitting some highlights that for their console sales that it it did get a specific mention there, honorable yeah. mention. When I go back to look at the Nintendo list, of course, uh, not in one of the titles that Nintendo reported as a, its one million sold or higher uh, list. Yeah, that is a. I think that's a 
a, a kind of a key comparison there of that it doesn't quite hit that level that even if it even if it sold well compared to the rest of the Ubisoft Switch games, it did not necessarily swell well uh, across Nintendo's lineup. Um, this year, I grabbed THQ Nordic because they had uh, been doing some moves and acquisitions. Right, this is THQ. This is Nordic. Uh, Nordic Games, which scooped up a lot of the THQ license during their fire sale bankruptcy a couple years ago, and over the past year also scooped up the THQ name. Uh, they publish games for a variety of, of places. Uh, we saw um, uh, both kind of traditional RPG strategy games on the PC, uh, Deep Silver, which gave with games like Agents of Mayhem, which did not perform very well. Um, but it also uh, has, you know, they've got a couple games coming out uh, this fall, or at least within this, well, actually, they they mention these games as upcoming properties, but they do not pin them down, unlike Ubisoft did, where they talk about Biomutant and um, Darksiders 3. So THQ Nordic is kind of a mess uh, to parse out because... They, they have a lot of, they've been doing a lot of acquisitions, so they're, they can report that their total sales are up 673%, but most of that is due to an acquisition of, of Coach Media, or Cock Media. Um, so without that, their sales are still up 64%, which if we're looking at everything else, that's not so bad. Um, so again, the year over year for THQ Nordic, uh, were up about 68% uh, for their quarter. So they they did see some good sales. Uh, part of that is related to, um, what is the, the game, Kingdom Come Deliverance, or one of the PC role-playing games that released uh, in the springtime here that they published as well. So I'm going to move over to Japan here and hit on Square Enix and Capcom before we kind of wrap up our, our analysis. Square Enix, again, uh, I don't know that they had a big uh, tentpole release during the holiday season last year, right? They did not have a Deus Ex. They did not have a Tomb Raider. Um, you know, I'm trying to think. They had, in January, they had their Dissidia Final Fantasy fighting game, which has not sold very well. Um, so their sales overall are down 2.5%. Uh, and they cite specifically, uh, it is, and I quote, a decrease in the number of blockbuster titles as their reason for their their loss. They did see strong performances on mobile, um, but again, overall in their gaming division, uh, this is where, right, this is the mobile helps bolster the, the platforms. Uh, their gaming division was still down about 3.8%. Um, they strangely though you know so so here this is this is japan uh, and gaming companies that they have they both capcom and square enix have amusement uh segments of their business some of this is pachinko titles um and, and other types of of machines um uh, but square enix also breaks out they have publications and they have merchandising and so they they cite uh, strong their their publications, which includes comic book sales for for their franchise titles like Tomb Raider, uh, are up ten percent. Their merchandising is up seventeen percent. Uh, so again, they may those are not big components of their business, but they are, are probably they are increasing components in a year where their their game sales have been down. So Capcom, on the other hand, sees an increase of 8% in, in sales uh, year over year. And a lot of that is contributed to the strong success of Monster Hunter uh, World, which was released in January, as, as you know, since you purchased it, right? And that saw a big bump in their, their quarter four earnings as well. But they also went out to went on to name... Um, uh, Two other games that that did pretty well here. I'm stumbling over the fact that they also specifically mentioned that their pachinko revenue is down, given the the volatility in the pachinko market right now, right? Which is very interesting from a, a Westerner point of view. But anyhow, the two other games that they they highlighted as as really hitting and having sustained success 
are Resident Evil 7, which was released last fiscal year, but continue to see a lot of sales and DLC content, and Monster Hunter Cross, Two Cross, Double Cross is what it is. Um, XX, Double Cross, obviously. Um, but that game is also, the Monster Hunter game is uh, a Switch game, that was out in Japan and just got announced that it's going to be localized for Western audiences as well. So a lot of kind of up and downs, but I think your analysis there, Glassicles, in terms of the majority of third-party publishers saw thin thin margins in their in their revenues and their profits, uh, where uh, our, our first party and our publishers uh, software or hardware manufacturers saw a much greater increase so any other any other pieces that stood out to you or 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 things we want to talk about here before we wrap up and and hit our hour mark uh, there were definitely bits and pieces i may not be able to remember uh them all as they sprung to mind while you were uh doing your brief um i wanted to mention i thought thq nordic had one big release in the last year like a triple a Thing that landed squarely on everybody's radar, but I can't find it at my fingertips right now. Um, hmm, I'll have to look it up as well. So yeah, I, I think the I think the big thing for me, one of the biggest takeaways is Activision. You know, we we talked last year in the build up to E3 how they kind of had like just one game, right? Uh, to talk about, um, you know, and uh, and 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 that's done now, right? So, um, it but. The, the the read of your notes from the financial report this this smacks of me of a of a company searching for a direction and a vision and a strategy um it it looks very much like the role sheet for dell uh before uh, michael dell took the company private um and it sounds like maybe the type of thing that winds up happening because your board um wants you to strike after every you know nearby adjacency um, in, in, in an effort to make more money, and what you wind up with is this, is this huge, highly diversified perf- portfolio of, of ununified, uh, non-cohesive bits and pieces that don't really make sense as a greater whole. I, 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 I'm, I'm interested to see if we don't see Activision start to consolidate some of these business ventures into business groups and, and shave them off um, as, as subsidiaries or their own business unit. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, right? That I mean, this will be the the question for them is that if if they need that to support their overall their business, or if it becomes a a, a too risky piece and it makes more sense to to spin them off to be their own their own piece, right? I mean, we just talked about Sony doing that, you know, that they've they've spun things off for their their games division or you know branching out there, uh, but they've also brought it back in. Uh, in terms of it also allows them to to have a stronger financial report if if one section is kind of floundering and i think that that certainly was the case last year when we talked about this where the catalog that ubisoft had within their portfolio was relatively thin especially on the activision end and i think that is consistent where if you look through the the report here the activision games are really two games it is destiny and call of duty uh, you know, there's not much else besides that. There's not a very diverse. So those are two first-person shooters, one of which is kind of struggling in its recurrent engagement uh, with Destiny 2. Um, so, yeah, I think that that for, for Activision it has has the potential to be a very concerning piece from an investor p- uh, standpoint is that there's, there's not a lot of diversification. We're at a time where they had you know, Guitar Hero and Skylanders and, you know, then Call of Duty and other pieces, you know, that they were, they were out into different markets where here, you know, they, they do mention, you know, Crash Bandicoot Remastered, but that doesn't necessarily, you know, give them a whole new franchise yet at this stage. Well, and I was going to also mention when they were big publishers in, in PC games as well. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, again, they had they've gone from being a very diverse company to uh, at least a game portfolio company to being very narrow and kind of culling things out. Uh, but again, they, uh, they do, and they make it mention of this in their report. They have a huge back catalog of IPs that you know they aren't necessarily 
doing a lot with them, but they have the ability to tap into that. And so, it, you know, we may see things like with the success of Crash Bandicoot and if Spyro hits well, that they're spinning back up kind of that that family friendly platformer in some type of way, um, you know, or, you know, I think the the thing I kept thinking about as I read this is at what point does King become the predominant game platform for Activision? Uh, you know, and I think that that, given where where they're at and how much do they start to to lean on on King's uh, infrastructure to leverage some of those existing IPs, where if if what they're seeing in in increases in sales are mainly on the mobile front, do they do they lean more heavily into that, uh, and and if so, how? Yeah, and I don't have a good answer for you. Um, of course, you know one of the things I wouldn't be crazy to see, right? To basically see a you know, say what we will about Activision as far as their their level of evil being right up there with EAs and, and often I in fact from a CEO perspective, um I, I definitely, you know, jump Kodak in, you know, with a guy who is, you know, all about the dollars at the expense of, of gamers. Um but uh but I'm also not super you know, in a year where we in a, in a number of years, right, where we have seen THQ go away um and uh and visceral be shut down and we've lost some of these classic studios. Um, you know, studios, classic, you know, EA studios being renamed and rebranded as just, you know, EA location name. Um, and the same, of course, going on with Ubisoft. Um, I'm not really interested in, I'm not crazy about seeing, uh, you know, a, a classic publisher um, in their brand kind of subsumed um, with a mobile company, you know, being their overarching title. Uh, you know, while while this historical legacy kind of label, you know, goes it's up into the background. But yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I, I I hope that's not the direction that we go. But you know, just looking at the financial numbers, it's hard to not see that trajectory. Um, but again, I think you know this is where it, of of the EAs and the Activisions and the Ubis, you know, Activisions in a unique spot because they've got that ability to kind of rotate between a, a number of big platforms. And I think. You know, it, looking at looking at EA's releases for the coming fiscal year as they project out, right? They've got um, they've got a a big quarter with all their sports games, and then they've got a quarter with Battlefront, and and that's about it, uh, right? I mean, so you know, it, it'll be very interesting to see, you know, where what continues to happen with EA. We've got an announcement of Battlefield. Five happening tomorrow and how that excites people so yeah and again on ubi's front you know they their 50 percent of their sales are coming from their their back catalog right of their their legacy games so things that were not released within that fiscal year so things like rainbow six and wildlands and things that have a long tail for ubisoft that worked well for them last year and has continued to work well uh this year so We'll see what that means as they they we all head into E3. So, I guess I think we are coming close to our hour mark, but I think this is actually a really good good show to have before we come into E3 because now we've kind of got the the business sense of of our our platforms and our publishers, and we'll see how they how they leverage that or spin that as we come into E3 in the next couple of weeks here. Yeah, I do one other comment specific to one publisher. Also surprising, Ubisoft men, doesn't mention um, the performance of uh, Rainbow Six Siege, uh, which has been on a tear and it has to be some level of money maker. So, yeah, um, I guess if I if I comb through, it's it's mentioned in there, but it's mentioned in their kind of strong back catalog sales. Right, and of course it was mentioned. Was it was it mentioned or was it made any bigger of a deal of uh, uh, back with is it um, Skull and Bones being moved to next year? They do mention Skull and Bones uh, being moved to allow players to have a more complete uh, experience. As as one as a corporation would phrase something like that. Yes, right. <laughs> the delay is a good thing for all involved. We will sell more. Don't worry. So, uh, all right. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry, I lost track. I realized you were you were uh, queuing me up because I'm technically supposed to be hosting this episode. So. 
thanks so much. Uh, I thought it was a great episode as well, DB. I thought um, a little uh, little tighter and shorter than last year. That's also partially due to, I, I think, not a ton of news. Um, yeah, I think last year we had a lot more to kind of digest. And it was the first year that we were seeing some of these digital trends, where right. now that they're kind of year after year, it feels less of, uh, of a sea change and more of like a, a rolling tide. So, of course, we will be back on uh, later this week on the Thursday night for our new show as regularly scheduled. Um, we'll also be, I think next week, we'll be talking pre-E3 coverage or some level of discussion. Um, and then, of course, we will do a big E3 coverage uh, over the month, um, you know, uh, while E3 is starting, while E3 is going on, and then also uh, in the wake uh, of it um, of it, uh, of it following those uh, those keynotes, we always have a lot to discuss, and it takes us a few shows to get through them, uh, given our 45 minutes to one hour time limit. So, other than that, DB, anything that you want to mention? No, I think uh, there's continue to be some news that you guys will hit on on Thursday. So, stick around and everybody else tune back in. Yeah, and hit up the channel, check out the uh, additional streaming or game capture content that we're posting. Uh, I think uh, Cyrus Prime probably has some PUBG. Uh, matches up there so we're posting those for your additional viewing pleasure uh so you can get to see the cast um in their native habitats uh gaming um in addition to seeing us uh, on the podcast each week so um that's going to do it for us this has been episode number 45 of the uh of enough to keep going go is that right did i get the right number 46 i think we are 46 yeah 46. last week was 45 that's okay it's a special episode so we can play with the numbers right all right. Well, thanks a lot, everybody, for joining in. On behalf of DBQ, the E2KG network, and the other cast members uh, from the channel, that's going to do it for us. Signing off, we are out of here.